Our speaker today is Dr. Nathan Smith. <clears throat> He's the senior pastor of Heritage Baptist Church. He grew up in Tanzania, East Africa, where his family served in church planting missions. It was there that he gained a deep love and respect for the cultures and peoples of the world. He has a passion for the rigorous exposition of the scriptures so that God might be known, his grace in Christ realized, and the Christian be moved to obedient sacrificial mission. Nathan frequently says, no matter who you are or where you're from, we're a church of broken people all in need of God's grace. How true. He received his bachelor's degree in biblical studies and a master's degree in business administration from Liberty University, a master of divinity and ministry leadership in Islamic studies from Columbia International University, and a doctorate in expositional preaching from the master's seminary. He's been a senior pastor of Heritage Baptist Church since 2012. He's married to uh, his wife, Jessica. They have three children, Caden, Lydia, and Jason. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Nathan Smith to our chapel this morning? Well, it is an honor and joy to be able to be with you here this morning. I have such a deep love and respect for Dallas Theological. And it's also very intimidating seeing how many students and gifted scholars and future ministers that are here, and I am very excited to see what God is doing through you, and just hearing continuously, watching your graduates go forward to the nations, and hearing the ministries that are being done. So I praise God for you. I'm not going to take a lot of time making any further comments. Would you join me in prayer as we get into God's Word this morning? Father, we thank you for this morning, and thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to understand your Word. And Holy Spirit, we pray that these words that you have penned, through faithful men throughout the entirety of history, using both men and women to demonstrate your grace to the nations. Would you make these words live to us? Would you make these words live to me? And I pray, O oh God, for my brothers and sisters here this morning, that you would give them great grace and insight and humility in ministry, recognizing that we are all desperately in need of you, O oh God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My assignment, as I understand, is to preach to your heart. And I appreciate that assignment because I would like to preach to no other place. Because the whole person is what God is interested in. Not just simply your product or what you do in ministry, but your mind, your body, your soul. Everything that you give and offer to Him is a sacrifice of worship. And I would like to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, a very familiar portion of scripture. And as we come to this section, I want to take you to the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. How many of you have been to Israel? You've been to Israel? Isn't it just wonderful to watch how the Monopoly pieces interact with the board, as it were? It helps give the context for how the biblical story unfolds. On the northern side of the Sea of Galilee, in the area where Jesus did the bulk of his ministry, is the place where we have the Sermon on the Mount. This is the place where the most powerful sermon ever given was uttered. It is often said that the first thing that you say and the last thing that you say are the things that stick in people's minds. And as Jesus got up that day, perhaps as the wind blowing off the Sea of Galilee, and if you've been there, it's always windy, but it's always lovely. It's just a beautiful place. And he stands up, and as the crowds hush, and they wonder, what is he going to say? And he opens his sermon with the Beatitudes, Latin for beatus, blessing. And these blessings highlight for us what I have often called the gospel life. This is what the Christian life is supposed to be. It has much in common with, for my Old Testament scholars out there, with the Old Testament concept of chesed, right? Covenantal blessing. And those who are under the covenantal blessing of God, this is what their lives look like. It's not what you do in order to get blessing, but rather those who are under the blessing, the covenant love of God, this is what their lives look like naturally. This is what flows from them. And this is what the Christian life is. Poor in spirit. Those who are humbled by God, who have a keen awareness of sin, a gentleness of heart and life, a hunger for God, mercy givers, pure, holy. They are peacemakers, reconcilers in our culture, but most importantly, reconcilers of men to God. They are also persecuted. 
They are hated by the world. They have a hope for heaven. And if you could summarize the Christian life, you're going to live humbly. You're going to be a keen sense of awareness of your own sin. You're working to love people, reconcile God. And here's what the world will do for you. They'll hate you for it. And Jesus lays that all out there right up in the sermon. This is the path of the disciple. Now, I'd like to spend our time this morning in the third beatitude, blessed are the meek. And I say, think about ministry. And I think about you as future ministers. This is a character trait that is more important than the degrees you hold, the talents that you hold. And let me restate, it's not a character trait. It is a product of our relationship with God that is built upon the first two Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I should say that the the blessing of walking with Christ, look at the second half of all the Beatitudes, and this is what you get. When you follow God, you get the kingdom, you get comfort, joy, you get the earth recreated, you get joy, you get heaven, you get God himself. It's beautiful. And Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, this word is a notoriously difficult word to translate. Because what does he mean? And I like to unpack it in the context of the Beatitudes because I believe it helps us to understand. And here's the definition I want to give you. Meekness is the gentle and tender attitude that is produced by a right perspective of self before Almighty God. Meekness rises in proportion to our perspective of God. The more meek, the bigger the God. The littler the God the more self-confident bravado we must perpetuate in order to be more winsome to people so that people will be attracted to us instead of the God we're trying to talk about. Okay? Meekness, tender attitude produced by interaction with God. Meekness is not weakness. It is not a personality trait. Some people look at uh, men or women who are naturally quiet and they say they're meek. Uh, that, that, is our, that is our importation of our English language onto this concept. But scripturally, meekness is not a character trait. It is the result of interaction with God. It's not something that you can manufacture on your own. It's something that comes as a result of a walk with God. Sinclair Ferguson said this, The meek man is the one who has stood before God's judgment, abdicated all his supposed rights, And he has learned in gratitude for God's grace to submit himself to the Lord. And I love this. Be gentle with sinners. The meek life. Because he has been so confronted with the gospel of grace. She has been so confronted with who God is and what they have been given. It perpetuates an attitude that is gentle with sinners because of what they've been given. It is the result of of the tenderizing process of God's grace. You know, I feel like I can see how someone apprehends God's grace by the demeanor of how they interact with sinners. And let me be clear, it is not acceptance of the sin. That's what the world does. But rather, it is an understanding and a compassion, and I love them enough to move them beyond their sin into relationship with God. When we think about who God is and the a meek behavior, James Montgomery Boy says, it's a soft and loving behavior, a subservient and trusting attitude before God. It is the life that has been broken. Now, I know we're in Texas. Does anybody ride horses here? We're in Texas. That's very disappointing. (laughs) I will say this. I'm going back five pounds heavier as a result of Papacitos and, God willing, Pecan Lodge after this. So I I hear the barbecue. uh, Your food is amazing. Don't take that for granted. You know, you have a lot of grace in Dallas by God's grace preempting the feast in heaven. I need to get back to the text. All right. (laughs) Soft and loving behavior produced by interaction with God. Now, when we think about our lives and the inner being of ourself, we are naturally like wild stallions. What is a wild stallion? From a distance, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? But up close, it is destructive, and it is good for nothing. What has to happen for that stallion to be useful? 
in the master's work. It has to be broken, doesn't it? The bit has to be put in the mouth. Now, the strength has not departed from the stallion, but the difference between a broken stallion and an unbroken stallion is the bit of the master in his mouth and so gentle as a result of the breaking process that you can walk up and put a hand on that horse, can't you? It's gentle. It has been broken. And where the master leads, it goes. Whereas the stallion doesn't want to be, doesn't want to submit. And it's destructive to those around them. It's like sin. Sin looks beautiful from a distance, but you get, the closer you get, the more destructive it is to you and to others. Meekness, having yielded our passions and will so fully to God, our life becomes gentle to the touch, steadfast and strong, fully submissive to the master's will, like the broken stallion. Now, the question you may ask is, how do we get there? Well, it is not something that happens overnight. Has anybody been to the tomb of the unknown soldier in Washington, D.C.? Okay, lots of you. More of you have done that than ridden a horse, but we're in Texas. All right, all right. Anyways, you watch these guys, and I remember going in December, and it was freezing outside, and the poor guy had snot dripping from his nose down into his mouth. I know you're like, oh, my, I haven't eaten lunch yet. Stop. Uh, but he was there like a rock. Tell me, how did he learn that discipline? Did he just wake up and say, I'm going to become uh, an elite guard? What, what happened? He had to be broken through boot camp. He had to learn discipline and training, and then finally had to put it into practice. When we look at the Beatitudes, I want to argue textually that these are progressive building blocks that first begin with brokenness. How do you achieve meekness? First of all, you have to recognize that you are a beggar in need of God's grace. The word that is used in Matthew 5, 3, batakos, has the idea of a destitute beggar. Blessed are those who recognize that they have nothing, that they bring nothing, and are utterly in need of God's grace. And if you do not recognize that you bring nothing, are nothing, and you need him, then there's no way you can possibly live the rest of the Beatitudes. This is the beginning point. And isn't this salvation? Salvation is not what you bring to God. Salvation begins with the heart that says, I have nothing, I need God. But it's also a daily discipline of reminding ourselves and brushing our teeth with gospel truth and waking up and saying that salvation in the gospel is not something that I shelve. It's not a ticket out of hell and into heaven and I'm done. It's not a commodity that I display, but it is a daily truth that I relive and I tattoo to my being to remind myself that I can do nothing today but for God's grace in my life. The smallest of tasks are impossible unless God be in it. When we think about the journey, brokenness, and then blessed are those who mourn. I've read and studied so much on this one word, trying to figure out what is he saying. And people say mourning, comfort in a general sense. Again, I want to argue that mourning consistently in the New Testament as a word is used in connection with mourning over one's sin. Blessed are those who are broken and blessed are those who have a keen awareness of their own sin. Think about the Apostle Paul. Did he not say, I'm the chief of sinners? The least of all saints, the most godly, mature men that we probably in history outside of Christ, and yet he was increasingly cognizant of his own sinfulness as he grew closer to God. It didn't move him into desperation, but it moved him into doxology. I've been given this, and God continually gives me the grace to see what a sinner I am. How many of us pray on a daily basis, God? Give me the grace today to see even more what a sinner I am so that I might appreciate more the grace that you've given me. Is that part of our discipline? D.A. Carson said, this is the morning experienced by a man who begins to recognize the blackness of his sin the more he is exposed to the purity of God. If the seminary process simply fills your head with knowledge and does not humble you and increase your sensitivity to sin, to a greater appreciation of God's grace, then we, the church, have failed you. And you have failed yourself. This knowledge is not just so that you can argue in the ivory towers of academia. It's so that you can walk out of here armed with nuanced, complex, simple, 
beautiful truth about the uniqueness of our God and proclaim him with such fervency and clarity that the world cannot help but say, in this place are true followers of God. This is and must be our heartbeat as ministers of the gospel. Now, we talk about mourning, and this is a very practical thing. I find this in the church all the time. The church does mourn sin, but often we begin with mourning the world's sin before our own. And here's the implication, is that when we start with mourning the sins of the world, and then we mourn the sins of others, by the time we get to us, we're like, I'm not that bad. (laughs) Right? But when we start in the heart and we recognize the blackness of our own sin, And then we move to others. We have compassion. And then when we look at the world around us, instead of just being hostile in our message, we say, but for the grace of God, I would be doing the exact same thing. And then it gives us a heart and passion for mission, for loving people. And when we do not begin with a humble brokenness before God, how do we ever expect to do mission well? And my heart is in God's heart here. Most importantly, Jettis and Nathan's heart, God's heart, is that we might experience his grace to move us into mission and in that context experience the fullness of his joy. But as we experience sin, I want to challenge you on a specific point. One of the reasons we don't mourn sin is because we do not see its severity, that it has incurred the wrath of God. Wrath and hell are unpopular topics. You need to arm yourself with that today. But if we can retool and say that the wrath of God and the anger of God towards sin is actually, in fact, the thing that helps demonstrate the value of Jesus, it will help reorient our thinking. When we think about God's wrath and God's anger, it is described in terms of of something that is judicial, but also deeply emotional and even explosive in a sense. In Romans chapter 1, we have the wrath of God is revealed from uh, from heaven against all ungodliness, uh, that that, that word um, that we look at, and it has a sense of judicial wrath. In Romans chapter 2, it says wrath and fury. The other word, thumos, has the idea of of an emotional flowing fury that's deeply personal in nature. Uh, This was a, a photograph that was taken by a South American photographer. And he captured this volcano and explosion generating lightning and thunders, the combustion of gases together. And actually, I think that, you remember on Mount Sinai when God descended on, in fire, brimstone, thunder, and lightning? Maybe using natural phenomena, something like this. But it's something that was so awe-inspiring, you recognized, who am I? When we understand God's wrath and that God is going to bring his wrath. Isaiah 51 says, wake yourself, stand up. O Jerusalem, you drunk from the Lord, the cup of his wrath. This is, this is foundational. If you want to understand God's grace, you need to understand his wrath. For the wrath of God is orge, his settled judicial wrath, because we transgress his law, but also his fury, Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2, this, this, this emotional pouring out. Why is God emotionally wrathful? It's not a Greek capricious god or goddess. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, I have three children, so precious to me. Uh, My my lovely little girl, she's eight years old, and and daddy's wrapped around her finger. Anybody else know that feeling? Any other guy in here? Okay, right. If one of you can... Um, assaulted her in the most horrendous of ways. And I responded with indifference. What would that communicate about the value that I put in her? You say, well, she must not mean that much to you. Is it not my justice and my righteous anger that actually validates the worth that I place in her? Is it not justice itself that demonstrates the value in the worth of that which was transgressed? Therefore, I would argue with you that when we talk about Revelation chapter 19, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, coming back to to walk out the fury of his anger, it's because his Father 
has been accosted by our sin. And his anger is both personal and judicial, validates the infinite worth of his father. And so he comes back in personal vengeance for the vindication of his father's honor. Why is the father so angry? Why? Because his most precious son has been accosted by our sin. And if he did not respond in wrath, it would communicate the little value he places in his son. And I would argue that Trinitarian theology is fundamental to understanding God well. And the deeply personal interaction between grace and even wrath. And to say that a God who is angry about nothing cares about nothing. A God who is angry is a God who deeply loves. Now, because he loves his son, he has to answer sin. But also because God is love and merciful, he what on the cross withheld that wrath for a period of time so that on the son that wrath might be poured out on the one accosted so that we who accosted him might experience grace, mercy, glorification, fellowship in the Trinity, eternally with God forever. Why? Because we deserve it? No, because simply God said, I'm just going to show love and mercy. This is the gospel, guys. If you don't walk out of seminary with a love for the gospel, then your education has failed. Your efforts have failed. You need to pray every single day. The gospel is not just how to get people through the gates of eternity. The gospel is the core of our being as Christians. This is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, I have decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. I want to know the gospel. I want to understand its implications. That understanding the gospel, brokenness, mourning our sin, recognizing what we've been given, breeds a meekness and a gentleness. Sinclair Ferguson again says, there's probably no more beautiful quality in a Christian than meekness. It enhances manliness. It adorns femininity. It is a jewel polished by grace, but it is all too rare. Is that because so few of us know what it is to be poor in spirit and to mourn for our sins? Is it? When we get into the world around us, it is so easy It is so easy to be attracted by lesser jewels. Do not neglect the jewel that saved you from God's wrath and continues to breathe life into your being every breath you take. When we think about meekness, what does it look like? Moses was called the the meekest person that ever lived outside of Christ. How did he get there? 40 years in the wilderness. What do you think was going on? He was being broken. He's being humble. He's being shown his own finiteness. And then God shows himself mightily in the pouring out of the plagues. And then Moses walks into the next, wild, next period of wilderness wanderings with a great sense of who God is. And that even when his own family members accused him, he was able to entrust himself to God. And when you get into churches, into ministry, and your fellow believers accuse you, you can say, but I know, Romans 8, because of what Jesus has done for me, there's no condemnation, and my position is secure with him. And that strength and confidence in our being enables us to respond gently, kindly, without trying to manipulate people around us, but rather just demonstrate the fruit of the gospel in our life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he went through some hardships, didn't he? When reproached, speaking of the meek, they hold their peace. When treated with violence, they endure it patiently. When men drive them from their presence, they yield their ground. They will not go to law to defend their rights or make a scene when they suffer injustice, nor do they insist on their legal rights. That's so anti-American. They are determined to leave their rights to God alone, non cupidi vindicte, which means not responding in vengeance. As the ancient church paraphrased it, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there shouldn't be law. I'm not saying we're, we're not thankful for the freedoms that God has given us. But how quickly we go to defend our rights instead of abdicating our rights for the Syrian peoples that are rushing to our borders for the first time in a thousand years. That's not activistic speaking. 
I'm saying that for a thousand years, North Africa and Syria have been unreached with the gospel of grace. And they're coming to our borders. Do we insist upon our rights? Or do we see this seismic upheaval of society across the Middle East as one of the greatest gospel opportunities in modern times? Be careful of what citizenship you fight for. Are you citizens here first or citizens of heaven first? Where are your primary allegiances? What type of churches and ministries will you lead? Will you, oh my, I'm going to step on some toes here. Are you going to preach some sort of pseudo-Christian melded patriotism or are you going to preach the gospel of grace that transcends cultures, languages, ethnicities, skin colors, and people groups? What are you going to do? Who, who are you going to exalt? Are you going to present the restoration of this nation as the ultimate goal of our lives? Or are you going to look towards what Jesus said? You're going to be hated, reviled, rejoice, not in this place, but in glory. One of the reasons we fight so much to hold on to our current existence here is because of weak views of heaven. Weak views of God. Weak views that what we are going to have is infinitely better than anything we have here. I do not want my kids to grow up in a home where their security is here. I want them to grow up that no matter what happens, that they know their joy is secure in a God who is bigger than anything that this world will throw at them. Jesus himself was meek, wasn't he? Meek, lowly. Now, he wasn't broken of his sin, and yet he was incredibly humble. He didn't mourn his own sin because he was perfect, but he did mourn sin. All of the Beatitudes Jesus Christ himself first exhibited and gives us as a model. Anybody want to follow me? What do you must do? Deny what? Take up your... Oh, and by the way, that exam is not a cross. Too many people, I'm taking up my crosses. Taking up your cross is walking in the footsteps of Jesus. It is not the simple hardships we face on a daily basis. It is the life of the cross. And then follow me. Come after me. Walk the gospel life. He who had the power and created everything. He who has omnipotent, omnipresent, omnitemporal power and yet forsook that in order to to assuage the wrath of God and to give us grace and mercy and to take His yoke upon us, to, to follow in His footsteps. He was gentle, lowly in heart. May we be gentle and lowly of heart and be touched by the grace that He gave, gave us. I pray that DTS, like you have already been doing so well, and that your ministries will produce an entire generation that have been so overcome by the gospel of God's grace that it reflects in the gentleness of your touch, your lives, how you interact with broken people, with fellow difficult Christians, and that people walk away and say when they have been in your presence, I have the fragrance of Christ upon me because they so exuded his loveliness. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Would you give them a deep sense of the cross, of Christ? May they be humbled by it. May they mourn their sin. May they seek to live a life that even should we be persecuted, may we respond with such gentleness that it confounds the world around us, with such joy that people are absolutely befuddled by our confidence. Oh, Father, we pray the name of Christ is exalted here today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.